Mais mmh. chers collègues, nous sommes très heureux d'accueillir aujourd'hui en visioconférence depuis Taïwan. Madame. We're very happy to have with us Mrs. Audrey Tang, the Taiwan Minister for Digital Affairs. Uh, Minister, welcome. Thank you very much. On behalf of all the members of the Committee of Inquiry, thank you for being available and thank you very much for agreeing to this so quickly. Thank you very much for being here to talk about uh, the uh, issue of uh, interference by foreign foreign powers, which is something that both our countries face. Beyond the military threats that uh, was openly displayed a couple of days ago, your country, your people, are faced with uh, a number of hostile activities, especially when it comes to the digital space, and this on a daily basis. The response capabilities of Taiwan to these attacks are often held up as an example by experts. And this is the reason why we wanted, Minister, to have you with us today. We are therefore very happy to hear you, to hear your thoughts on these topics and uh, to know more about what your country has done and what you wish to do, what you wish to do as a way to ensure the uh, autonomy of our country. We would also like to apologize for the delay. I know that you have a very busy schedule and we certainly hope that this will <clears throat> not uh, jeopardize that. And I would like to again apologize on behalf of all the members of the committee. I would also like to point out that uh, this hearing is broadcast live on the French National Assembly website and the video capture will then be available on demand with the translation for those uh, of the uh, you who are here with us. Uh, it is uh, a hearing that will be interpreted from English into French by the National Assembly Services. Now, Minister Tong, I will leave the floor to you for a opening speech for about 10 minutes, but if you wish to take more time, please feel free to, if you want to say more about uh, what uh, your democracy, what your country have endeavoured to do in order to better ensure the independence of your country. Mm. A few uh, more words. So, so you do not uh, have to uh, do more here since you are a uh, representative of a foreign power. Thank you again, Minister, and please, you have the floor. Um, ten minutes is just fine. Um, and good local time, everyone. I'm Audrey Tong, Taiwan's Digital Minister. I am truly honoured to address the French National Assembly's Investigative Committee on Foreign Interference. As you know, Taiwan stands at the forefront of global digital democracy. We're valiantly defending against the encroachment of authoritarianism. And as a result, as you pointed out, we face a myriad of cyber attacks from abroad. Just one example, between 2021 and 2022, exploit-based cyber attacks against our government agencies doubled, and it highlights Taiwan's importance as a frontline battleground for cybersecurity. Another striking instance occurred during the former U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan last August. During that time, the distributed denial of service attacks or DDoS attacks surged to an unprecedented level, 23 vote in a day compared to the previous peak. And digital signage was also hacked with malicious messages. But despite these attempts to undermine our democracy, we prevailed. None of these are singular isolated events. And Taiwan's circumstance is not unrelated to Europe. Undeniably, the world has witnessed the growing significance of cyber warfare, as evidenced by Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And as a firm democratic partner, Taiwan is acutely aware of the threats posed by authoritarian expansionism, and we have extended aid to Ukraine without hesitation. Now, France, as an important democratic country in Europe, I think France must also accelerate 
this partnership on digital democracy. Because after all, we are all facing the same issue, which is totalitarian regimes exploiting technological advancements to consolidate power and to redefine online norms, manipulating the internet to control and polarize digital communities. And today's emerging technologies, such as generative AI-powered interactive deepfakes, they are poised to cause intense harm while fueling cyber criminal activities. So in response, we established the Ministry of Digital Affairs, MODA, last August, with the mission of digital resilience for all. That's to say to quickly recover from adversity, to adapt and to learn from the experience to strengthen our fitness. Upon the ministry's establishment in August last year, we immediately revised key regulations to limit risky products, to enhance electronic signage security, and to strengthen our defense against all sorts of cyber threats. And that was the first official document that I signed. So now we are uniting public sector and private sector cybersecurity resources. We're conducting regular exercises to safeguard our critical infrastructure in emergencies. Specifically, we're implementing zero trust architecture in our government organizations as part of our national strategy. We're also integrating new satellite providers with the aim to ensure continuous communications in times of crisis, preserving societal resilience and fostering connection with allies, with friends, partners worldwide. So even when an upcoming earthquake may destroy all our submarine cables and even our data centers, mm -hmm. our investment in emergency backup networks demonstrate our commitment to safeguarding democratic resilience. Guaranteeing the viability of non-terrestrial networks as an emergency backup involves conducting proof-of-concept projects. So this proof-of-concept project encompasses installing satellite receivers at 700 locations around Taiwan and three foreign sites, including, of course, Taiwan Island and outlying islands and remote areas. So we're investing around 160 million euros over the next couple of years into this proof of concept. And the goal is to ensure that those satellites can perform functions like video conferencing, live broadcasting, like the kind of video conferencing we're having, uh, which is part of digital resilience called emergency resilience, which impels us to effectively respond to various crises including cyber attacks and natural disasters. But this is not all. We are also focusing on empowering our civil society by connecting to the worldwide democracy network. So one example, our ministry's website uses this new technology called Interplanetary File System or IPFS. It's an emerging technology for decentralized democratic data storage to resist censorship. So everyone around the world can donate connectivity to back us up, while also supporting journalists and whistleblowers in autocracies so that their reportage remain temper-free. So this approach fully embodies how our ministry integrates the core principles of decentralized web or Web3 using digital signatures to build resilience through public, transparent, globally applicable, temper-evident credential technologies, while also strengthening our connection with worldwide people focusing on democracy. And to ensure that these practices can be fully utilized in an online world, allowing anyone and everyone to co-create content, to share data stewardship, to have complete control over their own data. We have joined various international standard organizations, for example, the World Web Consortium, W3C, 
and the Fast Identity Online Alliance, the FIDO Alliance. And we are working with those global partners to promote the applications of decentralized technologies such as decentralized identifiers or DIDs. And based on this spirit of collaboration, in April last year, I joined France and over 60 partner countries in signing the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. We pledge to create a resilient, pluralistic, inclusive internet that safeguards freedom and human rights. Now, the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, or DFI, is founded on the shared values and it represents an outstanding example of cross-border collaboration. And as Taiwan and France both have signed the declaration as democratic partners, I think we both deeply respect freedom, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and international order. So we eagerly anticipate working closely together to enhance digital democracy and resilience. And finally, uh, this approach, I think, is embodied in the ministry's overarching vision. It's called plurality or collaborative diversity. When people from all walks of life can form such digital public spaces together, we can empower the voices reaching across ideological divides, and we can uncover our shared values in plain sight. Now, as we navigate uncharted waters, I urge you to stand with Taiwan in the pursuit of digital resilience. We must tap into our collective intelligence, innovation, and determination to effect real and lasting change. So let's embark on this journey and show the world indomitable spirit of democracy together. So merci beaucoup, uh, and live long and prosper. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Ministre, pour votre expo. Thank you very much, Minister Tang, for a very uh, targeted message and your message about democracy and, and, and common values that we share here uh, at the French National Assembly. I think we all agree in saying that we share your uh, struggle, your uh, fight for sovereignty and for human rights. So, um, Minister, I would like to ask you for uh, not clarifications but additional details about uh, your policy and your action in Taiwan and uh, uh, my colleagues may have some questions if you agree. So my first question, Minister, is this. Uh, at the beginning of your uh, speech, you explained that uh, uh, Taiwan was subjected to a myriad attacks from uh, foreign uh, countries or bodies, you did not specify which, uh, which, and of course, perhaps you may not wish to name any names, but you said that they uh, became amplified uh, during the visit of former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, but also uh, that, that there was a new wave after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, to give us more information here in France, perhaps, you could give more information without uh, uh, undermining the security of your own country. Perhaps you could give us more details about yeah. how these attacks took place. During the period you were referring to, did that affect uh, the uh, ministries that are the prerogative of the state, so security, uh, homeland security, etc.? Or is it also a threat for private individuals? Uh, we are afraid, for example, of attacks, uh, some of which we've been subjected to, like hacking of hospital systems. Can, can you help us to understand the depth and breadth of these attacks and how you deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis? Thank you. Thank you for the great question. Um, daily, we face millions of hacking attempts uh, from abroad. So this is the, the baseline. But when I said that last August, um, there was 23 times more than the previous peak, I specifically mean uh, that a lot of um, hostile connections 
from abroad try to deny the service of important websites, such as the Ministry of National Defense, uh, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Presidential Office, uh, and so on. And while they did not, of course, succeed in um, destroying any data or in tampering any data, it did cause a couple hours or a few hours of connection disruption. So that when journalists try to connect these websites, anyone connecting to these websites, they see a busy line. But at the same time, as I mentioned, there was digital signages like advertisement bulletin boards and so on outside the Taiwan uh, rail station and also uh, in convenience stores such as 7-Eleven uh, that was tempered to display hateful messages. And there's also disinformation, that's to say manipulation of information that said, for example, uh, that the Ministry of National Defense or the Taiwan Real Station have been taken over uh, and so on. Uh, and when the people want to check the official websites for uh, official clarification, well, they cannot connect to it. So we see information manipulation, this and misinformation, uh, as well as cyber attacks working in tandem in a coordinated way, in a hybrid way. So I hope that answers uh, your question about some of the details. But as soon as we switched, as I mentioned, to this static, published-based, decentralized web approach, we mitigated this attack. Uh, in fact, I said publicly to the press that our ministry's website went online the same hour uh, as the PLA uh, started their military drill. Uh, and we've not even suffered one second of downtime. Now, once I said that publicly it's published, we get a lot of free testing, of course, uh, but of course we have not been taken down. Uh, and so through this, uh, our people learned that uh, keeping a website busy is not the same as taking over its control. And so there was, generally speaking, no overt panic, and the stock market actually raised uh, instead of plummeted. I uh, hope that answers your question. Certainly. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer technology where over 200,000 computers, volunteers around the world can voluntarily donate their connectivity and even their hard disk if they want to help backing us up. It's more famously used uh, to store the NFT profile pictures uh, like the board, ape, yacht club, and, and other pictures. Uh, so it has its roots uh, in this community of Web3, um, NFTs, uh, and so on. So by choosing this infrastructure, uh, we change the dynamic of defense. Whereas before, uh, the defense need to spend a lot of resources, and the offense can just choose the weakest link and deny us the service. By uh, tying our static content to this public infrastructure of Web3, um, an attacker would have to take down the entire IPFS volunteer base around the world in order to take us down. And along with all those NFT profile pictures, that is, of course, not feasible. And so the attackers uh, would not succeed. Uh, and so we chose such technologies, not because it's a secret, but exactly because it is free software, it's public code, and everyone, even autocracies, uh, which still have people uh, who are whistleblowers or journalists that choose this technology so that their reportage remain temper-free and we mutually help each other.
Merci, Madame. Thank you very much, Minister. One last question before I hand over to our rapporteur. It has to do with the uh, support and that you would like all democracies uh, to support, the support to the Declaration on the Future of the Internet. Could you enlighten us once more uh, on the content of the Declaration and why it is helpful to our democracies and in particular how uh, it would be a good thing for your country and for other countries that are under daily attacks uh, that are targets uh, for uh, hostile actions. And a sub-question, perhaps, for a number of years, months, do you feel that there is better collaboration between democracies, between people who, like you, are in charge, in charge of these questions in democracies? Is there more cooperation in terms of exchange of information, um, cooperation in terms of fighting these attacks in a more coordinated fashion and a more brotherly fashion, if you like. Thank you for this great question. Uh, to your first question, uh, the Declaration for the Future of the Internet uh, resembles um, a multi-stakeholder approach for internet governance and Taiwan is included as a full partner or a full democracy that has the same um, membership uh, as France or any other partners. So this is a markedly different uh, arrangement to other uh, more traditionally multilateral international organizations where Taiwan often had to participate under an observer or some other status. Uh, and the DFI also uh, works on very practical things. For example, um, um, sharing of data in a trusted way, because all the DFI participants' beliefs uh, in the civil liberties and the citizens' right to privacy. So instead of making the citizens' data transparent to the state, we need to make how the state uh, uses the citizens' data transparent to the citizens and also extend that to uh, the governance of global uh, private sector corporations uh, in the uh, algorithmic accountability, especially accountability around uh, large language models and other sort of generative AI. These are very active topics that we can uh, work together. Indeed, uh, we are working with many people now on what we call AI alignment assemblies, where people can uh, collectively, using digital democracy tools, set uh, our uh, expectations on how those AIs should relate to the society, and also have those uh, private sector AI companies to take into account such citizen-led um, ideas. Uh, and some AI companies even call it constitutional AI, like democratically um, chosen constitutions to govern how AI interacts with the humanity. And because these, like climate crisis, are global topics, it's especially good for people in the DFI uh, partnership to work together, to align together these um, assistive intelligences or AIs. Hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answer. I will now hand over to our uh, rapporteur, Constance Le Grip. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Hello, Minister. We are very honoured to have you with us today and to be able to ask you questions here as part of our investigative uh, committee on political, financial, and economic interference by foreign powers. And uh, like the chairperson of the investigative committee before me, I would like to reiterate our support and the support of a large majority of uh, uh, French uh, political representatives here for Taiwan, for representative uh, democracy. It's a common 
struggle, a common fight to bring democracy and uh, to preserve democracy and uh, liberties. We know that there has been uh, some military movements around China, organized uh, around Taiwan correction, around Taiwan organized by China, and that this has led to what well, they worry uh, because I'm not there to feel the pulse, but certainly these military movements have led to questions. Uh, and it's very important for other democracies, such as France. It's very important for other democracies to send out messages of uh, uh, support. And so that's uh, a first message I wanted to put to you. Now, in your presentation, you focused quite a bit on the Declaration for the Future of the Internet that was co-signed by a number of countries, including France and Taiwan. And that common declaration uh, is really very interesting. And you also said a lot and, and highlighted uh, transparency and accountability. And that certainly is your focus as Minister uh, or uh, as digital minister, I know that that is uh, something that you hold uh, close to your heart, transparency, accountability, even radical transparency vis-a-vis uh, -vis your fellow citizens in terms of the relationship between the government and citizens. It's, can you say a bit more about that uh, passion or that true... Uh, obligation of transparency, if you like, and and how the Taiwanese population is engaged in cyber resilience, as you described right. it. Uh, I know that under this policy, uh, there's constant, immediate, transparent information about cyber attacks and who or what organization they are attributed to. Uh, your numerous cyber, cyber attacks, but are there any other things you want to you want to tell us uh, uh, under this transparency policy? Certainly, uh, indeed, transparency and accountability uh, are our core values, and this is because without transparency um, in digital affairs, people focusing on safety or security people focusing on technological progress is constantly uh, in a uh, tug of war. Uh, I'm both overseeing the National Cybersecurity uh, Institute and administration, but also the administration for digital industries, for digital transformation and so on. Uh, if they work in a siloed way, usually as we have seen during the pandemic, there is uh, like a, this narrative that you have to choose between uh, privacy and civil liberty on one side uh, or public health on the other and so on. And it leads to policy making that are either like flip flops or a bad compromise that nobody is happy about. On the other hand, if we are transparent in the how and the why of policy making, if as I did, that every single um, lobbyist visit, every single journalist interview, all the um, monthly ministerial meetings that I hold and so on, are published not as summary, but rather as the Assembly Congress records, uh, as full transcripts. Then people on both sides uh, who care about progress more or safety more can participate before policy is set and they can even co-create together new innovative solutions that are both safe and good to the industry. The privacy enhancing technologies, various ways to do contact tracing without compromising privacy and so on, are co-created with the civil society uh, because transparency allows for participation in agenda setting. So making sure that everyone who are closer to the pain, to the suffering, to the injustices 
uh, brought about by digital transformation can propose their own redress, their own um, innovations. That is the key to foster a co-creative, depolarized relationship between the security needs and the developmental needs. Thank you. You have um, had very positive words uh, when it comes to uh, intelligence, to artificial intelligence. You have been very positive about the possibilities lying with uh, artificial intelligence when it comes to human activities. Now, of course, uh, you all know that in our old continent, that is Europe, for many uh, men and women who live here, mm. there is a, a certain level of um, uh, dubiousness when it comes uh, to artificial intelligence, yeah. if not concern or very uh, or fear. One of the uh, first to maybe reactions uh, that uh, AI triggers in the European Union countries uh, is oftentimes that uh, of uh, suspicion. The EU is prone to set up frames and regulations when it comes to AI. So what uh, I thought was particularly interesting in what you said was the optimism your, when you talk about uh, the new, uh, the upcoming new revolution. My question is, therefore, how do you foresee the threats, the dangers having to do with the application of uh, artificial intelligence when it comes to the uh, manufacturing of fake news, when it comes to uh, manipulation of news and therefore manipulation of citizens, both in, in Taiwan and mm. elsewhere? How do you foresee this? Indeed. Um... The newer generation of language models and generative AI, including interactive deepfake pictures and videos in real time, um, is a real threat to democracy. Uh, indeed, I have in my laptop this large language models that can talk the way that I talk. They can synthesize my voice uh, and my image. Uh, and uh, we must um, know that each and every person who want to uh, make a use of good or good make a use of bad, it's now almost impossible to stop them from obtaining such open source, freely available generative AI tools that doesn't need a large data center, but just a laptop to run. And the entire uh, GPT-like language model fits into just a USB stick. So it's also very hard to prohibit the transfer of such technologies. On the other hand though, uh, I believe as long as we can align those AIs so that they are, again, transparent and accountable, then they also hold a lot of promise in translating across not just languages, but also cultures, also generations. Um, the solidarity that was previously difficult to build across ideological or cultural divides become possible with the translation, assistive translation of the language models. But we need to hold the makers of such technologies to account so that they're transparent and accountable like my eyeglass here, right? Um, my eyeglass is quite transparent. It assists uh, me seeing you and also it doesn't um, push uh, surveillance advertisement to my retina or scan my retina, right? So it is uh, upholding my dignity. It is not a sort of authoritarian intelligence. And if it breaks, I can fix it with super glue. I actually just did a couple of weeks ago. So it's also accountable to the person using it, not uh, some distant manufacturer. So we need to hold the AI makers to account using such principles. And I think the European conversations around AI is very worthwhile as a conversation uh, that we need to also replicate around the world. Yeah. 
Merci. Euh, S'agissant des très nombreuses... There have been a large number of cyber attacks faced by Taiwan. These cyber attacks have been uh, attributed to uh, a number of powers and individuals. Are they... Are a large number, a majority of these cyber attacks attributed to the People's Republic of China? <clears throat> Are there a number of attacks that can be attributed to North, uh, Northern Korea and organizations located in North Korea? I certainly hope that my questions uh, um, aren't a source of them. Embarrassment, but since you are, uh, you do promote radical transparency. I dare hope that you will answer them. Certainly, uh, in Taiwan, as I mentioned, because uh, most, if not all, of our um, high-speed communication to the rest of the world are through the submarine cables. So when there is a large cyber attack, a denial of service attack we can trivially see that it is not domestic, that it comes from one of those submarine cables. So when I say abroad or foreign, I mean specifically that the origin, the origination of that attack is not from within our jurisdiction. On the other hand, because um, there's so-called botnets, that is to say the computers making the attacks to us may not be because their owners maliciously want to attack us, but because they have backdoors installed that allow some other entity to take control of their computer so that their computer become so-called zombies uh, to attack us. It's difficult to make a full attribution of where those botnet controllers are, which is why we always, even under radical transparency, always say, oh, it's abroad or it's foreign, because that's the extent that we can trace such denial of service attacks. That's, uh, that makes complete sense. Now I have one last question, and then maybe other members uh, of parliament might wish to ask a few questions, Minister. So my last question is, in order to raise awareness among the Taiwan population as to the uh, threats, the cyber threats uh, that uh, the country is faced with uh, on a regular basis, but also as a way to better empower the population as to how to defend themselves against such attacks, could you tell us in a few words what happens within schools and within other organizations? What, how do young Taiwanese learn from a very young age how to better understand and how to protect themselves? Is there a level of uh, awareness raising campaign that takes place among the youth? Definitely. Um, before joining the cabinet uh, in 2016, I was part of the basic education curriculum committee. And back then, we saw the rise of mis- and disinformation, of information manipulation, and we specifically changed the curriculum so that what used to be literacy classes, media literacy, data literacy, digital literacy, became competence classes. So data competence, media competence, um, and all sorts of comp competence. Literacy is when you consume. At most, you do some critical thinking training, but it's not social. You're not producing anything. But competence means that the students get to collaboratively fact check even our presidential debates and forums, uh, and that they uh, have those air quality measurement devices, air boxes, that measures air quality and contribute to a distributed ledger so that they become resistant to the um, disinformation or fear mongering about air quality. The same for water quality and many other things. 
So as soon as people, including very young people, engage in the act of fact checking, they become immune to disinformation attacks on that area. So it is not the products of fact checking, the facts that doesn't inoculate people. It is rather the process of going through collaborative fact checking that protects people as minds from polarization uh, and disinformation. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Rapporteur. Thank you, Chairperson. Minister, I would like to uh, thank you for your contribution to uh, the uh, engagement and, uh, and to the open source, to your, to your commitment to open source. I also have a background in IT. I would like to ask you about uh, the solutions to fight uh, uh, foreign in interference. That's number one. Number two, you were heard by the uh, G2 EU Committee of Inquiry. And I would like to know more about uh, how you uh, answer that questions and uh, how you see the best, what is according to you the best way to uh, fight uh, interference? Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, digital resilience for all is our ministry's call to action. Um, of course, we need to make sure that journalists, including civic journalists, have access to broadband. This sounds very simple, uh, but broadband really is a human right uh, in Taiwan. And also, we need to make sure that professional journalists uh, co-prosper with the largest social media platforms, including Google uh, and Facebook. And so we hold uh, regular talks to make sure that their work on journalism is conveyed to those largest platforms and those large platforms contribute uh, to the fund, to digital transformation and so on, that brings journalism to the forefront of the information uh, systems. And also equally important is the civic engagement, the societal resilience. So even in end-to-end -end encrypted channels, um, it's called LINE in Taiwan, it's like WhatsApp uh, in Europe, People, when they receive something they think is scam or computer virus or disinformation, they can voluntarily report to this civil society run um, ecosystem that has collaborative fact checkers, including the COFACTS and international fact checking network members, leading cybersecurity firms such as Trend Micro or our um, very promising startups, unicorns, uh, like who's called from Google Look and so on. So this is really a people first public private partnership that takes this collective look on the trending disinformation scam and phishing attacks of the day and collaboratively work out um, how viral it is and then focus the collaborative fact checking and deterrence on specifically those messages that are gaining virality. So this is both collective sense-making and also co-producing counter-narratives that can deter the sharing, the spreading of such disinformation, for example, by community note-like attachments to those viral disinformation. So instead of taking anything down, this is actually adding more context, adding more clarification that uh, protects the recipient from further variation of this virus because now they have received also the antidote in the form of a public notice clarification. Merci, Audrey. Thank you very much, Audrey. Now, Oh, oh. What about your hearing with Europe, the uh, G2 uh, interference uh, in Europe? Uh, what kind of information did you share with them, if there's uh, anything that you can reveal, of course? Um, so I regularly uh, engage with, uh, including uh, EU versus Disinfo, 
uh, I actually personally contributed the traditional Mandarin translation of the thisinfo.quaidaose.fr uh, website, uh, and that's part of your efforts as well, uh, the uh, Ambassador for Digital Affairs, uh, to counter this information, uh, and so on. So we maintain a robust uh, civil society to civil society uh, connection to share our playbooks uh, together. And because most of the tools that I mentioned is in the public domain, or at least in open source, uh, there is the regular collaboration going on on GitHub and other open source places. Thank you very much, Minister. Minister, thank you. And Madame Chassang will be the next to ask you a question. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Minister. Uh, like my colleagues, I would like to say that it's uh, quite an honor for us to have the ability to ask you questions here today. And we share your passion and the same democratic values in particular, uh, raising people with critical minds together against uh, uh, threats and interferences. Uh, now, the rapporteur asked you a question about uh, education and uh, digital literacy education, and I have a, a top-up question on that. You mentioned the new technology you're working on or implementing, which is a bit like a blockchain for files, where everyone can cooperate within a broader system. Does that require citizens to know, you know, the basics about digital technology to make sure, uh, as a way of ensuring that that technology is not diverted? And does uh, that provide uh, more information? Uh, does that help to make more critically minded citizens? And then I have is a question about uh, technology and social networks. In your mind, is it possible to maintain the existence of these algorithms that can be manipulated? We know that social media can be highly polarizing in society, and that's a danger to democracy. So can we continue to have the, uh, these algorithms while maintaining our democracies and while maintaining mm. a critical uh, thinking? Some imperialist powers uh, have made uh, attempts to destabilize our countries. They're sometimes very sophisticated. They're sometimes very difficult to identify. Do you think that there is a risk as such for democratic pluralism and freedom of expression? Thank you for the uh, great questions. Uh, indeed, uh, we promote decentralized technologies because they are open source. Uh, and because of the nature of Web3 technologies, um, it's almost impossible to restrict the citizens from studying its functionalities and forking, meaning that to develop a new version of it that is governed by any community that they are a part of even though that they may learn this kind of uh, blockchain or other applications from a, for example, financially minded community, there is nothing preventing them from forking this technology to work on historic archival, to work on reporting, to work on many other purposes. So it is not just open source, but also very friendly to forking. And this is why uh, we always promote such technologies, the public code technologies, because it maximizes people's uh, control, people's sovereignty over how algorithms interact with their community. And that leads to your second question. While algorithms can um, make people more polarized, there are also algorithms specifically designed to depolarize people. Um, one example is the technology called POLIS, P-O-L dot I-S, that we regularly use. Um, if you check my Twitter timeline, I recently posted a POLIS conversation during the Summit for Democracy this year, asking AI risk 
and AI capability and AI ethics practitioners, whether despite their very polarized attitude about AI, is there something they can agree on? For example, we should focus on tackling misinformation and deepfake first, uh, which is something they all broadly agree on. So using this technology, we surface the common values hidden in plain sight, and it de-incentivizes uh, people from engaging in polarized, uh, politically charged, uh, abstract trolling or other sort of non-constructive conversations. So again, if people are given the choice of what kind of algorithm to use, many people will prefer pro-social algorithms over anti-social algorithms. So as um, a state, what our work should be is to promote such pro-social algorithms and work with credibly neutral parties to set up the town halls uh, equivalents in the public square to really give them binding power over agenda setting so that people actually understand that there is a way to engage socially online without those antisocial addictive surveilling algorithms. Thank you very much. Another top-up question, uh, if I may. Do you think that we should, les citoyens, could or should put to, pour uh, faire société, ou en tout cas utiliser sur Internet uh, dans, dans les démocraties, algorithm to use uh, on the Internet in these democracies, should we let citizens decide? Yes, uh, we know that, for example, in the European Union Digital Market Act, uh, there is uh, interoperability requirements so that the gatekeepers of instant message communications of all sorts, when they are large enough, they must interoperate with each other in a way that the people can have a free choice regardless of where the content is posted, you can choose to receive it from another uh, provider of a different algorithm. And I think this idea of the freedom to choose between algorithms, but still engage in the same content together, this really is key. It doesn't matter if you call it Web3 or decentralized web or interoperability, it all speaks to the same vision that it should be the person wearing the glass choosing the glass, right? It should be the person receiving the information, choosing the algorithm that they wish to be engaged with this provider instead of being dictated by the intermediary or the poster of this content. So this is very abstract, I understand, but this is a general spirit. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson, speaking of the question. And of course, as usual, please feel free not to respond if uh, this may be harmful to your position or to Taiwan. There are uh, attempts, there have been attempts, uh, attacks against your democracies for about five months or more. And in the narrative of these hostile countries, there is the illusion that these authoritarian countries are par leur économie, mais aussi par leur régime uh, autoritaire, et qu'en face, les démocraties seraient uh, plus faibles uh, par nature, par essence, parce qu'elles sont uh, reposent, comme vous l'avez dit, sur les citoyens, ou qu'elles seraient faible pour diverses raisons, vous n'avez même pas envie de prétendre déployer puisqu'elles sont toutes fausses. Mais ce que je veux dire, il y a un certain nombre d'éléments dans la rhétorique que je ne pas approuve, mais donc, vous pouvez dire que, à travers des techniques, par la démocratie, par la transparence 
euh, totale par euh, la décentralisation, par la mobilisation. They were funding not only the technology, the techniques used are working on this by mobilizing citizens, by using decentralized systems. Now, France, of course, is not a, a country that's the same size as China or Russia, but that one of your tools is also to mobilize smaller scale countries like France. So, so for you, is this counter offensive or even offensive? Why not? Uh, do you... Do you agree that uh, uh, Taiwan and other countries should be uh, fit to fight with technology, but also via uh, content? Um, indeed, as I mentioned, uh, there are people in autocracies that nevertheless support Taiwan by joining such decentralized technology to help backing us up, but also helping to make their accounts temporary censorship resistant. Uh, and I think this censorship resistance is very, very important. So I do agree with your sentiment that a lot of the technologies we talk about, like the fact that a language model compress the almost entirety of the Internet's uh, variety of contents into just one USB disk that you can run offline and query a lot of historical archival uh, and historical personalities and so on. Of course, it's not as factually correct as a maybe a copy of Wikipedia or other encyclopedia, but it is generally useful uh, to people's jobs and so on. So that even people in autocracies, in authoritarian countries, are still motivated to get hold of a copy of the uncensored uh, language model uh, in either a local copy or with some VPN or some way to circumvent internet censorship. So by making sure that we contribute to such language models, for example, uh, France um, sponsored a lot of work in creating the Bloom uh, open science language model, which many Taiwanese um, people in both private sector and civil society are now adding our traditional Mandarin and other Taiwanese languages into the mix of Bloom. So just sharing this large language model actually fosters not just communication between our jurisdictions, but also for people in autocracies to have extra motivation to circumvent censorship, to engage in temporary conversations. So yes, I refer to it as democratic resilience, but if you say it's a counter-offensive, I would say that uh, it fits the bill. It's a good description. Yes, you have that. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, in the narratives that we need to fight, narratives coming from authoritarian uh, systems or uh, dictatorships in democratic countries, such as France for a number of countries, there have been a number of people, qualified people, either from academia or in informed uh, uh, circles. There have been a number of people who spread cultural stereotypes, for example, about Asia in particular, um, saying that China via Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, different schools of thought that have led to that country becoming great. That uh, uh, it is it is a cultural, it is because of its culture and its history that China perhaps sees human rights differently than uh, our democracies. And so in uh, these attempts, to interfere in our system. Do you think that this type of narrative is also being disseminated? And uh, do the free citizens of Taiwan respond to this narrative by saying that they defend human rights, they defend democracy? Is this a way of resisting this narrative? Well, um, the kind of top-down censorship top-down control, um, surveillance state, uh, and so on. I don't think any of these are found 
in those uh, traditions uh, that you just mentioned. Uh, this is something very new. This is authoritarian intelligence. This is uh, autocracy's use of emerging technologies. I don't think this can be connected to any of those uh, humanistic traditions uh, that you just mentioned. I think Taiwan's contribution is that we do have a lot of variety. We're a transcultural uh, republic of citizens of 20 national languages, uh, including the Taiwanese sign language, some Austronesian, uh, some using kanji, uh, the characters, uh, but we ensure that no matter which language, which culture and so on you're in, uh, democracy is the unifying experience, the unifying spirit uh, that we all enjoy and identify with. And so I think it is this plurality of this transcultural identity that is our contribution to the world in that no matter which kind of these um, honor traditions uh, that you are part of, uh, you can participate fruitfully in democracy in Taiwan and also it fosters translations of the human rights universal values into those traditions. So I think a bridging narrative is always can be found in any of Taiwanese cultures that is part of this transcultural identity. Thank you very much, Minister. My last question will be uh, as follows. Taiwan has been uh, famously the first country in Asia recognizing rights of LGBT people. <clears throat> During the rights recognition process by uh, laws in the legislative process as well as in the work of uh, Taiwan Supreme Court uh, with a view to recognize these people's rights. Have you been in a position where you have uh, noticed that uh, there were particular attempts to interfere from authoritarian regimes? when it comes to Russia, as well as when it comes to North Korea, and to a certain extent when it comes to China, these are countries that, that are yeah. not, uh, that are at least hostile to LGBT rights. And therefore, do you feel that there has been um, interference attempts having to do with uh, this uh, recognition of LGBT yeah. rights? from uh, foreign regimes and moreover do you feel that uh, lgbt champions in taiwan were the target of attempts to uh, interfere on a personal level both individually or as representatives of the taiwan government thank you that's a great question um so i can publicly share of course that uh, in 2018, when there were national referenda uh, related to the recognition, the form of recognition for marriage equality, uh, there were a lot of um, disinformation, information manipulation, especially on the more anti-social social media platforms and including by way of sponsored targeted advertisements. On the other hand, I would like to share that they, these are opportunistic, meaning they would sponsor advertisement that amplifies the extreme ends of both sides of a narrative so that it become even more polarized and people would not trust the democratic institutions because they're so polarized. So this is not about purely pro-LGBT right or against LGBT right. This is not purely about anti-vax or pro-vaccination. This is about the opportunistic use of algorithmic influence to magnify the polarized extremes and to deplatform the more nuanced deliberative voices in the middle. Uh, and because of that, 
uh, right following the 2018 election slash referenda, uh, the civil society people worked with the largest uh, platforms, including Facebook, so that leading up to elections or referendums, they would no longer allow foreign sponsored targeted advertisement on such political and social values because uh, after all, our campaign donation bans foreign contributions anyway, and we don't want uh, this to be a circumventing way of um, interfering with the political or social agenda setting. And similarly, radical transparency, honest advertisement requirements uh, was also imposed uh, by those largest social media companies as a self-regulation so that even for those domestic uh, messages, we can see its reach, how many people share it and who sponsored it and so on. So there's uh, more transparency and accountability. So that level of extreme polarization sponsored by foreign uh, money uh, actually became uh, much less uh, leading up to the 2020 elections. So I totally uh, agree that such issues such as LGBT rights uh, tend to polarize the society and we must not let foreign interference add fuel to the fire by sponsoring the uh, magnifying effect, amplifying effect of the extreme messages uh, through funding. Thank you. I have a question from the reporter. And if you still have a minute for us, I will have one last question. I would like to ask you about uh, the economic relationships between uh, Taiwan and the uh, People's Republic of China. Indeed, uh, trade between the two countries uh, are not only uh, significant, but they are also on the rise. Do you feel that uh, there is a risk here? Maybe there has been a debate in Taiwan, and maybe if the debate took place, maybe it's been settled. Do you feel that there is a risk that this will bring along a increasing attempts of interference between the People's Republic of China and to, to basically use this increasing trade as an opportunity to uh, have more stakes in Taiwan and maybe to um, to increase their attempts to interfere with Taiwan. Thank you. There was a uh, very large debate, public debate even, in 2014, uh, when people, half a million uh, on the street uh, and many more online, uh, deliberated on all aspects of the cross-strait service and trade uh, agreement. So it's the sample hour movement and uh, one of the consensus that people reached back then in 2014 uh, was that the then new 4G infrastructure uh, must not actually have the PRC so-called private sector um, vendors uh, equipment in it. Because if we do allow such so-called public sector, then we will have to continuously assess whether they become de facto state controlled at any given point and become uh, de facto not private sector. And if we had to keep doing this risk uh, assessment, the total cost of ownership is actually very large compared to if we simply work with vendors from fellow democracies. So that was a very important uh, consensus that were reached uh, back then. And in 2019, uh, we also, um, basically said in any public sector use, including service, hardware, or software, uh, none of those uh, PRC labeled products can be used as part of our uh, public sector or critical infrastructure and so on. So while of course there are trade going on, we set boundaries very early and very firmly and with a lot of participation from all of society, including private sector and civil society. Merci. Minister, thank you. This uh, brings us to the end of this hearing. 
I would like uh, Minister Audrey Tang for, I would like to thank you for the valuable answers and for the comprehensive uh, answers that you brought, uh, which uh, concerns all of us. And from a very personal viewpoint, I would also like it to uh, hail the courage and dignity with which living life and the inspiration that you are for millions of people, including youth around the world, beyond our cultural differences. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, National Assembly Services as well as the standing uh, representative of Taiwan in France. And the uh, session is 